I think that's really fair because in real life, people who behave in these ways, mm -hmm. um, who who want power and take it, et cetera, um, are often quite charming and funny and great to be around and fun friends. And so I think um, that was really, for me, the nuance of those uh, portrayals, taking these things that we think are simple and black and white and, and making them gray was really exciting. Guys, give it up for Team Bird Eater. <laughs> cool thing we do. Cool thing we do. <laughs> Put the energy up a little bit. Um, guys, congrats on this movie. It is a trip. It is a trip. I did not know what I was getting in for. I, I did not. I had no expectations. I knew nothing about it. And uh, it, it sucks you up. Uh, so congratulations. You guys are Thank great. You. The filmmaking is pretty spellbinding. Um, man, yeah, I was I was pretty wowed by this. Uh, first things first, okay? Uh, we had talked to me last year, Wolf Freak, Babadook, The Loved Ones. Why are Australians so good at making twisted-ass movies? <laughs> yeah, coping why is mechanism? That? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. It might be a coping mechanism. It might be the isolation is, is a very common feature in Australia. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go very far from the city and, uh, and, you, and you're kind of completely by yourself. Yeah. And that's like a common relationship people have with the city and the outback is they often will go to the outback and become somebody else or they'll take on like a certain persona. So that kind of duality is really persistent in Australia. Yeah. And I think conversationally in Australia, um, there's a lot of levity. People are kind of rarely earnest with each other. Usually we're just having a laugh. So I think there's also artists like to go a bit darker in the work to kind of balance that out. And yeah. that's yeah what we wanted to explore as well in yeah. our movie, that kind of combination of like comedy and quite like dark themes as well. Yeah. There was a documentary that came out a few years ago called Not Quite Hollywood. I don't know if you guys saw it about Australian filmmaking, mm. oh, yeah, yeah, but um, I, yeah, I'm, w I'm wondering sort of like how much of its sort of history, because it does have a really robust film industry and there's mm. so many amazing filmmakers and so many great actors um, that have, you know, rose to, international stardom, how much sort of a pride there is specifically in genre filmmaking mm. there. If you guys kind of came up and were sort of inspired by certain filmmakers. We saw uh, Wake and Fright when we were in film school, which was a fairly formative experience for us. It's hard to really pin down what genre that is, but um, made by an international filmmaker observing Australian culture and observing these things we're talking about where there's sort of comedy interlaced with suspense, interlaced with these this kind of like horror scenario, which is kind of being stuck somewhere isolated mm. overnight, not being able to leave. Um, so that definitely left an impression on us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there is a real groundswell recently with genre films. I also think it's it's just a way for ind indie filmmakers to break through. So indie, like what you can tell that an indie um, market is blossoming when there are more horror films coming uh, out of a country. I think I think that's usually the first sign of an indie um not that we're horror, but that's kind of the things like talk to me and Babadook. That's sort of like the first instances of something yeah. growing from the indie market, I think. Well, there's overlap because there's a lot of psychological. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Psychologically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah. This is a film that is, it's just very unconventional. It's very bold in its storytelling. It doesn't really offer any uh, easy answers. It teases a lot. It, the first half an, half an hour, you're asking yourself as a viewer, like, what is happening? What is happening between these two characters? Are my missing something? Did I, oh, did, did I not understand that? Oh, no, no, this is just, this is just, it's a challenging piece of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, Mackenzie and Shabana, how do you, how do you guys explain uh, this film when, when sort of talking about it ca casually? Like it's, it's not, I don't think it's an easy film to sum up. So I'd love to hear like how you guys describe it to people. We describe it very differently to each <laughs> yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially when we were making the film, we both had very, obviously we were both seeing it from our character's perspective. So we had, I mean, I'm on set, I, an old couple came up to us. We were shooting at a swimming pool or something and yeah. he started talking to Mac and she started talking to me and the conversations we were having were like, they could not be more different. <laughs> they were like shooting the shit, you know, like, oh. Sorry, no, uh, you about that. no, no, no. They, no. Were, they were having a this fun is chat, unrated. and we are oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> and her and I were having this deep conversation about gender and politics and sadness, and um, I think that sort of stayed true, right, yeah. even throughout this. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, like you said, our, our the, the way that we kind of got through the process was by kind of hiding behind the, the characters. Um, perspectives, although we were very aware um, of our own individual uh, feelings about them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it, it was very, very collaborative, I think, with between these two and uh, Shibana. Um, 
in terms of yeah the direction of the characters. Jimmy Jack, can you guys like bring us a little bit into the creation of this story, like in, in how you sort of landed on this couple, what inspired it? Can you talk a little bit about the origins of, of the actual story? We like the idea of making a movie about a couple with separation anxiety because that had a great inbuilt structure. Mm -hmm. You establish that relationship and then you separate them and see what happens. And then we were thinking about like what institutions are still separating the sexes. Bucks Night does yeah. that, right? No girls allowed. What happens if we bring... Otherwise known as a bachelor party. Bachelor I'm just going to translate. Bachelor party, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happens if the girls are invited to that? How does the behavior of the men change? Yeah. Um, and then bring in a, rela uh, a relationship that has some like emotional abuse. And then it became a movie about like how do, how do men react to the bad behavior of other men how responsible are we for our friends behaviors in relationships yeah i love that concept that you not not the emotional abuse co concept but the the idea <laughs> of what you were talking about of separation anxiety and separating them and then bringing them back together in like the most sort of extreme sort of social yeah. <laughs> dynamic situation yeah. um and yeah and everything goes uh, completely haywire it's funny i was just reading actually about there's a german uh, I think it's a German cultural phenomenon where the bucks, so the, the groomsmen will um, kidnap the bride the night before the wedding and take her to a bar and like drink with her and party with her. And it's the groom's job to go and find her. So it's like a weird inversion kind of what we're mm -hmm. doing. But I only found about, out about this like a week ago. Oh, that's way better. We should have done that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's cool. Yeah. You, you, have your, yeah. you, have your next, you have your next film. Yeah, we're just going to yeah. switch it up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. The German remake. Um, I mean, this is not a romantic comedy. Uh, how, how did you, I mean, it's a really difficult, uh, relationship to portray. Um, but it's also these two characters that have been together and you guys had to sort of find these guys did an amazing job clearly with the script, but you guys also had to find that on, on, on screen. How did you, how did you prepare to sort of, how did you build this dynamic between yourselves as actors to go into this? Well, I think initially it was quite an individual thing, um, kind of focusing on, uh, uh, you know, building your own idea about the, the relationship, about the character, about the story, because um, the, the, we did have quite a long pre-production process, but it was fairly interrupted in terms of COVID and a few other things that were out of our control. Mm -hmm. um, but then once that had happened, we'd done that kind of individual work. We still had a, a fair amount of time in pre-production to kind of come together and collaborate and, and um, throw the ideas at each other. And so we kind of had enough time before we started shooting to kind of have a fairly good idea after having already done the individual work about how we would like the, uh, mm. the relationship to work on screen. What were the thematic aspects to the film that you, that you two connected with? I mean, one thing just in sort of reading early reactions to it, I mean, I, 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 it's, it was pretty obvious to me, but one sort of common theme was the fact, you know, the fact that the film explores the notion of toxic, toxic masculinity. Um, what were the sort what were the them thematic um, aspects that really resonated with you guys. Yeah, I think I mean, masculinity is so fascinating and I think it's something we don't um, t talk about enough. Mm. Like, uh, and I think it's so, what I really love about this film and this story particularly is how charming the men are. And I think that's such an important thing about when we talk about masculinity, we seem to talk, or toxic masculinity particularly, we seem to be talking about like monstrous acts and like violent ways of thinking and stuff. But it's so much more nuanced than that and it's so unfair to be so reductive about it. So I think I really like that this movie, all the boys are so charming and so funny and, and you can feel in the audience like when you're watching the films, for me it feels like whenever the boys are on, the energy is high and the audience is like captivated and then as soon as I come on, everyone's like, ah, oh. mm. you know, um, and, and it, <laughs> that kind of happens. But I think that's really fair because in real life people who behave in these ways, um, who, who want power and take it, et cetera, um, are often quite charming and funny and great to be around and fun friends. And so I think um, that was really, for me, the nuance of those uh, portrayals, taking these things that we think are simple and mm -hmm. black and white mm -hmm. and and making them gray was really exciting. We talked about the sort of the, the trend of, you know, all this dynamite genre filmmaking that's, mm -hmm. that's coming out of Australia. Another trend I love that's developed within genre filmmaking specifically um, is the director, the director duo names. Uh, and you guys got a good one. Uh, I mean, we've, we've seen... 
uh, uh, radio silence. There's Rocka Rocka, and you guys are Fax Machine. That's right. Uh, how did you How did you land on Fax Machine of all uh, thousands all of names? You wouldn't believe <laughs> that was the best one we could come up with. We kind of just got sick of it, to be honest. And we're like, oh, let's find something that's like an analog form of communication that we liked. That kind of needed to resen- uh, like to send like a sender and receiver. I don't know. That was a vague kind of idea, but it was really just to have uh, a, a name for our kind of collective. Uh, filmmaking because we'd been doing a lot of shorts for um, each other in, in in film school and just out of film school and we felt like we were all sort of even if they were different types of films they were sort of under the same house so we needed something to sort of bracket that a great music in this film is well also mm. a, a heavy component of it um, you know South by Southwest I know it's your guys first time here but you know there's a film TV section and then there's the music portion which is actually what it was originally famous for it's a very robust yeah, music yeah. festival and it's known for sort of spotlighting um up-and-coming artists artists on the rise so for last question i want to ask you guys you can name somebody from the from the film or any other recommendations you have but who's an up-and-coming musical artist that you would recommend to us i want to say a little band out of sydney australia and this has nothing to do with the film okay. but uh royal otis Royal Otis. Royal Otis. Yeah, nice. great, great band. Okay. Um, check him out. Okay. And then obviously Andreas Dominguez, who did the soundtrack, is yeah. unbelievably good. Um, so, yeah, shout out to Andreas. Yeah, Andreas actually has a musical partnership. Um, it's called Doc Sportello, so you can find him online. But he's great. Very different to our music. but Yeah, yeah, very, very talented composer, Andreas. We met him at film school. Okay. And he recorded all of the score was done analog for the most part uh recorded in his like bedroom um that is like share house so mm. super like rinky dinky mm. and he just made this like very very grand score uh he worked very very hard on it so yeah cool yeah, Andreas to me yes cool. awesome well thank you guys so much for coming in thank guys you. give it up yeah, one man. more time for team bird eater thank all right thank you guys thank, thank you, you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs>